Aloha. Welcome to American Issues, take one. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. And today's title is Political Violence Shows Up at the Pelosi Door. Mega GOP spins the attack. You know, political violence, unfortunately, has been with America since the early days. Um, reminded of all the assassinations and assassination attempts against our leaders, our presidents. Uh, there are, of course, Abraham Lincoln. Teddy Roosevelt was shot in the chest while giving a speech. Um, a notebook actually stopped the bullet. Uh, McKinley was assassinated. Kennedy was assassinated. Ronald Reagan was attempted assassination. Uh, Bush Sr., all the way down the line. And then about five years ago, uh, while the Democrats and the Republicans were, were going to put on a char charity baseball event, uh, the Democrats were practicing on one field and the Republicans were practicing on another. And in 2017, a lone gunman uh, basically opened an attack on the Republicans on the field. Steve Scalise, the, uh, the House whip, uh, Republican for Louisiana, was critically shot and injured and wounded and in the hospital for quite some time. That was five years ago. Uh, let's fast forward to today where uh, many threats have been uh, levied against uh, public officials, not just politicians. And of course, with the recent news event that Paul Pelosi was attacked in his home by a lone assailant. And uh, the question is, how did we get here? Is it inevitable that we'll have violence or not? Uh, is there things that are spurring the violence, such as uh, mega GOP rhetoric? And um, we're going to discuss that and more today. I'd like to introduce my guests. With us today is our special esteemed guest, Vicky Cayetano, my co-host, Jay Fidel, and our contributor, Cynthia Lee Sinclair. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Hello. Tim. Jay, uh, to you first. Uh, we're dealing with a very heavy subject here, of course. Uh, has the political climate changed substantially since the shooting of um, the Republicans on the baseball field, specifically Steve Scalise? Uh, has, has the political rhetoric ramped up or is it basically the same and we just have a, a, long, a lone assailant that um, was inspired by the political rhetoric and enacted? What's your take on it? A mm, number of things. That was softball, by the way. Yeah. Oh, I said baseball. No, it doesn't matter whether it was baseball. It was softball compared to what's going on now. Oh, okay, yeah. gotcha. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and you're right in the way you characterize it. Uh, there was condemnation on both sides, um, and there was a you know a morality and ethic that responded. Um, not today, not today. Um, and I think the you, you know the um, example of Paul Pelosi is really in, inform informative because we see the Republicans making fun in the, in the nature of Schadenfreude, you know. And, and we begin to understand that they really like this. It's like a, a ball game, which is uh, life and death, you know, a lethal ball game. And uh, it's, it's really hard to take if you have any ethics or, or morality left. What's interesting that, that has changed in the past five years is that there appears to be a real connection between the rhetoric and the violence. You know, at first, the rhetoric just was rhetoric. And you said, ah, they're not going to do anything, they're just spouting off. Um, now we find that, that 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 rhetoric actually leads to violence. And, and you know, a part of it is, in my view, the dog whistle thing. As uh, when you get up there and say that the indictment of Trump in Mar-a-Lago is likely to lead or will lead um, to violence, um, you're saying not only, you're not only observing the possibility you're actually doing dog whistle. You're saying that the people who follow Trump, you should take this as a message. And the message is, you, you are liberated now. You can do violence. I am telling you, this is a good time for violence. And he taught us that over his administration. Uh, he taught us that sometimes he was, he was doing dog whistles. And, um, and what he said in terms of uh, expecting violence was really a request for violence. I mean, Think about the, the comments that he made uh, on January 6th, you know? Um, we have to fight like hell, okay? And they did. Um, so I think that things have changed. A, uh, the morality has, has had declined dramatically in the country. 
Um, and, and B, there is now a clear dog whistle connection in a predictable dog whistle connection between uh, violent rhetoric and, and violence. So the answer is yes, there has been a number of assassinations in this country, much more, many more than we really should have over the past couple hundred years. Um, but now it's been liberated and it shows you that one person can change things and make things much worse. This happened in Europe in the 30s and it's happening with Trump here now. And this is one good indicator of how it works with him. Yeah, I don't know if you remember, but uh, about two months ago, we had uh, former Governor John Whitehay on our show. And he said something that I that hasn't left me. And that was, uh, Donald Trump has given permission for his followers to, to act and say, you know, horrible things. And it's that permission, I think, that um, maybe is the big difference between where we are today and maybe where we were five years ago when both Democrats and Republicans rallied around uh, Steve Scalise. I, I saw an image of when the Democrats first learned of uh, the shooting, uh, they gathered in the field, like 19 members of the Democratic uh, Party immediately gathered on the field and prayed right then and there. I'm not sure we're seeing that, nor, or will we see that? I don't think we will. Uh, well, one more, one more point yeah. that uh, comes off that is that um, you know we we don't have a um, we could call it a population or a base uh, that has the moral strength to say I am not going to respond to the dog whistle. I don't do violence. Rather, we have a, a base that says I'm I'm ready, willing, and able, and I can. I can be instructed and unleashed and liberated. Uh, just, just call my name and I'm there. Mm -hmm. and, and that's different. That's, that's not a good point. The way it was five years yeah. ago. That's a good point, uh, Vicky. To you on that point, Jay just made is, you know, is the base looking to its leaders to see if there's condemnation on on violence towards politicians, or are they um, ignoring the leaders no matter what they say? Or is it uh, a combination of both, where uh, there's the dog whistle, as Jay said, and sometimes it's a bullhorn. Trump was a bullhorn of racism and uh, invitation to violence. What's your take on that? Uh, as far as the, MAGA, and I'll say the MAGA GOP, I'm not gonna say the GOP, I, I will make that distinction. What's mm -hmm. your take on the MAGA GOP and their rush to violence or acceptance of violence? And do they look to our, the leaders of their party to get a wink and a nod that it's okay? You know, I'm a, I agree with what Jay just said. And, and while there have been acts of violence uh, in the past, they've been the acts of individuals. Uh, what concerns me more than anything right now is not just those acts themselves, but how the leadership of the MAGA GOP is responding. As you say, uh, President Trump has given permission, former president, to to not only uphold this type of behavior, but to encourage this kind of violence. There is no place for that in our country. And, and they will do anything, the, you know, the means justifies the end. They don't care what means it takes, even to sacrifice, compromise democracy in order to get their candidate in. That is what I'm really concerned about. And a community of people you would think that has more uh, grounded in character and common sense to speak up and say something, but no, instead this rhetoric is really triggering people to start, as we see on the mainland, uh, encouraging this kind of behavior. It's almost a badge of honor mm -hmm. for them. That's what concerns me. And, right. and that I think is what should be, uh, what we should be focusing on. Well, we did hear from Mitch McConnell immediately, and he did condemn it. Uh, he is a leader of the Senate Republicans. Uh, he's a leader of, of a big name in the party of the GOP. Um, but then we heard from others. Uh, we didn't hear much from Kevin McCarthy. And then we heard from the MAGA, the GOP, um, be it Carrie Lake, and her making a joke out of the whole situation, which she's been taking the task for. Or we had um, Marjorie Taylor Greene, you know, uh, talking previously about Nancy Pelosi and how, uh, and I quote, a bullet to the head would be quicker. And that was uh, in reference to getting her out of her position at the speaker, as the Speaker of the House. I mean, these are things that people pick up on. Don't so, forget Trump himself 
He yes. never said anything. Not a word. And, well, and actually, that, he that did, Jay. Oh, go ahead. He did. About the uh, Pelosi attack, he said yesterday, he came on late yesterday on social media, and he said, um, he always makes an, he always implies something that's not there, and he leaves it dangling in the air. In this case, it was, uh, again, conspiracy talk or thoughts. He said, the glass, meaning the door glass of the door, it seems was broken from the inside to the outside. And, you know, so it wasn't a break in, it was a break out. Now, this is crazy conspiracy stuff. Uh, the implication was that there was a relationship between the assailant and Paul Pelosi. And that nature of that relationship was a gay relationship that went bad. Uh, again, Donald Trump and trying to um, whitewash uh, responsibility of rhetoric that's being directed towards people of his party, and particularly the ones that are disturbed. So there was a response from Donald Trump. Uh, Vicky, back to you. Um, is it the chicken or the egg here? Is it, is it mental illness or those words that inspire those who are mentally ill to act? What I, do you think? I, I definitely, you know, while there's no question that we do have mental illness issues, uh, for me, if you have to say one or the other, it's the rhetoric. It's the rhetoric that is triggering or, you know, instigating these acts, encouraging them. We have never, ever had a president of the United States talk in such fashion, ever. And this should be a real warning to our country. You know. Good point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And this, is, people need to look beyond this about the Trump or the other candidates and really understand what's at stake for all of us. And don't think for a minute that it won't happen in this country. Yeah. Good could. point. Yeah. And I, I'm remiss, I forgot to mention um, Gabriel Giffords, the Democrat from Arizona that was shot in the head in front of a, a grocery store back in 2011. Uh, clear case of, of a disturbed individual, and it was a political motivation. So um, we can't forget about Gabby Giffords. Uh, Cynthia, what are your thoughts about the shooting uh, back in 2017 of the Republicans on the baseball field, softball field? Um, versus where we are with the attack on the Pelosi household. Um, are there any parallels for you to draw from? I have some actual um, opinions about that, actually. Nancy Pelosi came out on the day of the shooting when uh, Scalise was shot and said, what happens to one happens to all of us. And we are all together. And that's when they went to the field and prayed right then and there. That's how the Democrats reacted. Now let's look at some more details about what the Republicans did. Good old Donald Trump Jr. thought it was very funny to put a meme out on Twitter that is just a picture of underwear and a hammer on top of it. And oh, such laughter, uproarious responses afterwards. Then we've got the head of the GOP uh, campaign chairman, that guy, what's his name, Tom Emmer. And he put out um, a thing on Twitter two days before this happened where he's at a, a gun range shooting and then the tag is hashtag fire Pelosi. And so, you know, all of these things that we put together like we're talking about today with this rhetoric and some of it is so subliminal even with things like just a meme with a picture of underwear with a hammer sitting on top of it. And, and it's just horrendous to think about. And these exact same GOP, <laughs> just not too long ago, right? Were up in arms. Okay, these same people that are joking about what happened to Paul Pelosi are, are now talking, I mean, we're, we're then just up in arms, so angry because somebody was rude to Ted Cruz at a restaurant. And I think that is such a great parallel to look at. They think it's just funny to go and put a, a decent man who is doing nothing wrong in ICU, and yet they think it's horrible how terrible the Democrats are for being rude to Tom, 
Ted Cruz in a restaurant. And I think that's a restaurant for goodness. It's like they, they just, anything that's bad that they've done, they want to minimize. All right, let me, let me hit on that point, Cynthia. I mean, what you're describing, I think, is extreme hypocrisy. Yeah. <laughs> who, right. who ought to call them out for that? Oh. Is it the voters? Is it the media? Is it um, leaders of both parties? I mean, who, All of the who's above. responsible to stop this sort of stuff? All of the above. All of the above. Absolutely all of the above. I'm mad at the media for not calling this out a little bit more extremely. I'm, I'm mad at the, the media for treating these crazy MAGA GOPs like they're normal. Like it's just- Okay, well, we've, we've had four to five years of this. Yeah. Uh, outrageous behavior and outrageous rhetoric, outrageous words from the, you know, the commander in chief. Right. Yet where was the leadership of the P Republican party to call it out? Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, in 2021, Paul Gosar, uh, he's the Republican from Arizona. He uh, put out a, um, he was stripped by the way, of all his committee duties. And, and why was he stripped of all of his committee duties and responsibilities and leadership? He put out a tweet. It was an anime video depicting him killing um, Ocasio-Cortez. I mean, it was, although it was a, a meme, it was him shooting Cortez. Yeah. And so here's what the leadership said. That's not quite the leadership, but uh, Kevin McCarthy said, when or if the House flips back to the Republicans, I'm going to reinstate him in all his previous committees. Oh, you know, uh, every so I guess the question is, to what degree is the Republican leadership responsible for the increase of violence? Or is there any correlation? There, there's absolute correlation. And I think what I see happening is that they, when something like this happens, first they minimize it, then they mock it, then they celebrate it. And it's all so that they can support violence and force because they're gonna take what they want. And if they can't get it, they're gonna take it by force. And, and that's, I constantly ask the question, where are the good Republicans? When I lived in the South, I had friends and I still have them that are, are Republicans, staunch Republicans. They're not MAGA, they're not, you know, pro-violence and so where are they and I think they have more responsibility than anyone and what's the old adage that you know for evil men to prosper it doesn't take um evil it takes good men to say nothing right mm -hmm. um and so I, I don't I think I might have muddled that. that's all right I we but I you know, know that I know the quote <laughs> I know the quote and, so where are the good Republicans? We've got good Democrats being willing and, and bold enough to stand up and speak the truth to power. But even they're a little scared with all of the threats of violence. Now, all of that is even making the, the good mm -hmm. Democrats want to be quiet. And I think I'll throw out two names for you, uh, Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger. Yes, those, are the, those are the two that come to mind. Okay, Cynthia, thank you. I want, I want to lead with, back to Jay on a word that you mentioned, and that is correlation. Jay, you remember back in the, back in the day, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, um, there was great outrage about the amount of violence that was being portrayed on television and the desperate attempt by certain groups to say there's, it's gone too far, there's too much violence, it's too explicit, and it's influencing the minds of many young people. And the, the, the big fallback was, well, there's no correlation between violence on TV and violence in society. So to that, that point, is there a correlation uh, to the rhetoric or is it really a, a result of the dog whistles and the bullhorns that are being spoken by the, the mega GOP and certainly Donald Trump? Can we go back to that word correlation and say, um, where are we on that? And, and why won't people accept the correlation? It's all of the foregoing. You know, all these things feed into a kind of violent culture that we have. We have that already. And if you exacerbate it, then we have it more. And there is a correlation. There's also a dog whistle phenomenon. And we are getting more violent. 
and you know, I, and we can be upset about it. We can be sad that the media doesn't stop it, that other Republicans don't step up, but that's the direction. And and uh, you know, if you want to look at one event that pointed the direction so clearly, it was January sixth. That pointed to you know, it's only a Sunday walk in the park. It's not really violence, or violence is okay. And, and, and people say, well, there's going to be another insurrection. Well, yes, there is. It's an ongoing insurrection, and it is violent. But my, my question, and I would really like to be able to discuss this with you guys, is where is this all going to end? Um, you know, this is, this is uh, assassination attempts. Um, the, don't forget the judge in Virginia, the federal judge, uh, who some, some actually deranged lawyer came down and was looking for her in her home in Virginia, and he wound up killing her son. She, she was uh, reserved about it, didn't make a national big deal issue over it, but that was pretty frightening. But these are, these are one, one deranged person trying to kill somebody who is a, a, a political icon or a judicial icon, case may be. It's not street violence. It's not the kind of violence we saw in Portland, for example. It's not the kind of violence where that kid ran around with an assault rifle, killing people at will and then got off light. It's not that. But the question I, I, I put to you all is, is that where we're heading? If we give the nod to violence on a one-to-one -one basis, um, if we let it happen, if we don't condemn it, if the Republicans in there, I want to, I want to use a new word here, puerility, if the Republicans in their puerility, uh, you know, uh, make jokes about this, uh, where are we going? It's not going to stop in, uh, you know, in, in one time only assassinations. It's going to wind up in the street. And I, and I worry about next week. I worry about, the, you know, the threat of violence from Lindsey Graham, you know, where he said, if you indict a Miralago, Miralago, <clears throat> you'll have violence. Um, and likewise, if you have a, a, um, a provocative, uh, a series of provocative issues and results and outcomes in the election, whichever way that goes, um, you could have violence there. So I think it's, it's the next step that I worry about. You're about, yeah. Um, thank you, Jay. And let's entertain that, that thought. Um, Vicki, uh, based on Jay, what Jay just said, and let's compare that to the Carrie Lake's jokes she made um, about um, the assault on Paul Pelosi. Um, and though it wasn't explicit, the words itself, it was the tone and mannerism in which it was delivered. Uh, people in the audience definitely thought it was funny. And um, Carrie Lake, again, she's the candidate for the uh, governor in Arizona. She basically said, I'm tired of being taken to task and I'm exercising my First Amendment rights. So let's, in lieu of what Jay just said, as far as where is this going and someone clinging to the First Amendment, um, does that hold water? Well, we know that it doesn't, but he here's what I think we have to do. We've got to look squarely at what the issues are. You know, why, why is it that they have an audience that's latching onto this? And I think at the heart of it, both parties, we've become... Two parties with, that are so extreme between the liberalism and the conservatism. And I think for many of these uh, mega GOP people, they feel that they're losing control. You know, you have all these minorities now who are no longer just our gophers and housekeepers, but they're rising up in the ranks. The average Caucasian middle class guy is losing their position and middle class, especially look at in Hawaii, it's disappearing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a we're becoming a state of haves and have nots. And many of the haves are are people who come from other countries. I think this is at the heart of the I issue. And it's not to justify the behavior, but I think we've got to really look at how do we come up with solutions. And with that is really more of a, a centrist, moderate approach to the policies that we have. Uh, I think this is something that nobody's talking about, and yet to me is centered to the issues before we have a civil war. And I really don't think that that's- I, I, I think it's a great point. Um, 
I think grievance in white male grievance is really uh, has come to the forefront. And Donald Trump, I think, successfully tapped into that. But it's not just minorities. I also believe that it's a male female thing. I read a study re recently that um, many females will not date uh, a male that if they've gone to college, the female has gone to college, they are reluctant to date males that haven't gone to college. And so the more um, of this uh, grievance and being shoved back into you know, the back of the room, so to speak, um, because it's hitting them on all fronts. Um, good point, Vicki, thank you. And um, I'd like to add, go ahead. Date, you know why she won't date that person? Probably it's because she doesn't want this person to not respect her for what she's worked so hard to attain. Mm -hmm. I think that's at the, the heart of it. Not just come home and say, where's my dinner? <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> well, by the way, where is my dinner? No, um, no I, I think, I Vicky, I think you're spot on. That. You're spot on. I want to add a point to that. You're, sure. you're, you're, Vicky, you're talking about reorganizing our society. If you want to make um, you know, these um, middle-class Caucasian people happier and give them more, give them greater opportunity, well, and, and I would argue they have plenty of opportunity right now, but that's a, it's a subjective thing. Um, you're talking about reordering the society, which <clears throat> even if we decided, and I don't think we would easily decide this, um, that as a matter of policy, we should head in that direction. How, how could we do that? And how long would it take to do that? I suggest to you um, that we don't have the time, that the next step that I worry about is coming soon now. before we can make policies that will make everyone feel they, they have the opportunities they want to have. Yeah. Cynthia, I saw you shaking your head no. Uh, why? <laughs> um. Well, because I think that society is already being, you know, remade and changed. And white replacement theory is actually a theory now that has been studied for a number of years, for a handful of years, right? About this very topic that we're talking about. And you think there's any valid points to it? Well, if you're a racist, I can see how you would buy into it. Mm -hmm. but otherwise, no, I don't think there's any good points to it. Okay, even, good. even racists have, have concerns. Yeah. There you go. So, All right. Um, this is my thing. I think how we've remade society is that we've completely, um, we're living now in a post-truth world right? After what has happened, truth doesn't really exist anymore. It's all been devolved into opinion. And for each person can do whatever they want without any, you know, connection to facts or science or integrity or honor. It's like it's this whole new world where people can just make up whatever they want and spew it out onto Twitter, right? And now we've got Elon Musk at the head of Twitter, already in the first days of his new ownership, tweeting out conspiracy theories about what happened to Paul Pelosi. That's correct. And so, uh, and, and Donald Trump tapped into that. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yes. And so did a couple other um, GOP senators and uh, um, um, representatives. This is the thing. You know, earlier we said that. Well, Mitch McConnell came out and, you know, he said that, you know, he decried it. Well, he decried the attack. He hasn't said one word about everything else that's happened coming from his party. Right. It's just obnoxious and horrible. And no, he, he specifically uh, dodged that along with Kevin McCarthy because the right. criticism was to what degree is the Republican rhetoric causing this? And uh, they refused to answer on that point. And then crickets. Yeah, nothing. Oh, well, we think it was bad, but we're not going to say anything or look at these guys over here being absolute MAGA GOP okay. and no integrity type people. And so, so what's the next step here? Well, that's for your show tomorrow, Jay. <laughs> maybe yeah. so. Maybe you won't so. know until next Tuesday. Well, maybe you got to stay Thursday. tuned to tomorrow on Jay's show. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but that is the that is the next question is what is the next step and we've run out of time, so uh, stay tuned for the uh, Jay Fidel's uh, American 
American Issues Take Two. But before we end, I, I need to go around the table to say, um, what are your last thoughts on this? Um, it's, these are, you know, the election is right around the corner. Are you concerned? Um, what's to be expected? Uh, starting with you, Cynthia. I have two quotes. One is from uh, Representative Eric Swalwell, and it is in regards to this attack. He says, we must draw the straight lines that connect violent political rhetoric and violent acts. The Pelosi assailant's Facebook page looks identical to the Facebook pages of Trump, Taylor Greene, and Boebert, and more. All three of them have glorified violence, and then DePap acted on it. Um, okay, so the next one and the last one I have is from George Orwell. We have now sunk to a depth at which restatement of the obvious is the first duty of intelligent men. That's us. All right, thank you. <laughs> Wonderful, and, and, I love and your- women, And women, and women. And women, thank you, but you know. Yeah, you know, Cynthia, you always bring great quotes to the table and I appreciate it very much. Jay, your last thoughts on this topic. We haven't talked about how this affects us, us here in this show and our neighbors and friends, other politicians, other officials, other people who work for the government other people in general. It's terrifying yeah. to, think, to think that what happened to Nancy Pelosi and Paul Pelosi could happen to anyone. Yeah. And, um, you know, you gotta lock your door. And, and I don't know what else you can do. Maybe that's something to discuss on the next show. I don't know what else you can do, but the level of threat, the level of hmm. fear is changed in only a few days in this country. All right. Vicki, you get the last and final word for today's well, show. Thank you, Tim. As always, I appreciate this interesting conversation. And I just hope that uh, the voters will take, will pause and think about what's at stake here. You know, when you're attacked in your own home, that, that's sacred. Uh, when you're attacked because of what you believe in and not be able to have a conversation with the people, uh, that's really unacceptable. And so I hope that everybody will just take a pause here and understand that even if the candidate that you support doesn't make it through, we need to step back and look at democracy in action and really cherish what we have as a country, because that rises above everything else for all of us. And I hope people will have that ability to just hit the pause button and step back and look at this and don't just jump on that bandwagon of rhetoric because there's so much at stake here. And I really fear for our country. All righty, we'll leave it at that. I'd like to thank our special esteemed guest, Vicki Cayetano, my co-host, Jay Fidel, our contributor, Cynthia Lee Sinclair. Thank you one and all for joining us today. I'm Tim Apicella, your host for American Issues Take One. Please join us next week and join up uh, with the show tomorrow to discuss this further on, with Jay. Until then, much aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.